Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Technologies to Save Energy, Resources, and Time in Water System Operations. My name is Tess Clark. I'm a project manager, project assistant at Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. I will be introducing our speaker shortly. Before we get started with our presentations, I'm going to quickly go over some logistics and talk briefly about the Environmental Finance Center Network. I'm happy to report that we have a diverse audience for today's webinar. You can see that we have attendees from all over the U.S. and even some international folks. We had well over 450 registrants for this webinar, so I'm looking forward to hearing questions from you all. Attendees can receive a certificate of attendance for viewing this webinar today. This webinar has not been submitted to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits. AWWA recommends that you check with your licensing agency to learn about its criteria, rules, and what you need to do in order to receive credit for your attendance. It's your responsibility to verify this information with your licensing agency. If you need assistance in applying for credit to your licensing agency, please contact education services at awwa.org. For attendees who have an AWWA customer record, your certificate will be uploaded within 30 days of this webinar date. For attendees who do not have a customer record, you will receive an email from AWWA requesting that you create a customer record to receive your certificate. If you don't create a customer record, unfortunately you won't receive a certificate. Okay, so this session is one of several webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for the Smart Management for Small Water Systems program. The FCN provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all 50 states and five territories to help local water systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Okay, so here you can take a look at our small systems team. Our network extends across the U.S. and we have partners based in all regions, so take a look. We are going coast to coast here. And here you can see the areas of expertise that we focus on. Uh, workshops, trainings, and direct technical assistance are provided on all of these topics listed. So take a look here and you may be able to focus you know, see if you need energy management planning, water loss reduction, asset management. Take a look at these and maybe assess your needs. Okay, uh, the EFCN also has a small systems blog. You can learn more about water finance and management through this blog. Blog posts feature lessons learned from our trainings, descriptions of available tools, and small system success stories. You will also have the opportunity to subscribe to the blog at the end of the webinar. Okay. In addition to the workshops, technical assistance, and webinars, as part of this program, we are also creating a table that lists the major funding sources for drinking water infrastructure projects for each state and territory. Here's how you access those tables. On the EFCN homepage, Go to the Resources tab and then click on the Funding Sources by State, as you can see in the top right here. This is going to take you to the map of a, the country, and if you click on the state you're interested in, you're going to see that a PDF table of the relevant funding sources for drinking water infrastructure for that state can pop up. The table looks like the image on the left of the slide. For each funding program, it's going to include the name of the program, a short description, and contact information for someone who works there. Right, before I turn the presentation over to our experts today, I have two quick polling questions for you. So I'm going to launch those now and just take a moment to think about your response. Okay, so this question is what kind of water and or sewer utility do you represent? Read those choices carefully and select the one that makes sense for you. I'm going to keep this open for just a little while, and I will let you know when I'm about to close it. Okay, I'm going to close this poll in just a few seconds. Three, two, one. All right, and I'm going to share those results with you all. 
Great, it looks like we have a really diverse group today. So we have 6% of the for-profit water systems. We have a lot of local government, municipal water systems, and some cooperative associations and not-for-profits. And also some folks that aren't water systems today. Great, so moving on to our second polling question. I'm going to launch this poll for you now. What size water and sewer system does your utility operate? And think of this in terms of the number of people served. So select the option there that makes the most sense for you. You can choose from very small through very large, or if you are not a water system, that might be the, that is the choice that you need to select there. Okay, I'm going to keep this open for just a few more seconds. Let you finish selecting your response. I'm closing this poll in about three, two, one. All right, I'm going to share the results. It looks like we have some decent, a really decent distribution here, actually, fairly even, except for our folks that aren't a water system are the majority, but quite a, just quite a, quite a few sizes here. All right, and now I'm going to turn the presentation to, over to our presenters. Uh, today we have Nick Willis, who is a program manager at Environmental Finance Center at Wichita State University, and also Don Nall, who is the program manager at Southwest Environmental Finance Center. All right, turning it over to you, Nick. Everybody see that fine? Okay, um, today's webinar is going to cover um, kind of four groups of, of items um, that, that can help uh, save energy, uh, uh, reduce labor costs, um, and Im improve efficiency of, of uh, water utilities. These are lumped into SCADA. Um, I'm sure many of you on the line are familiar with this, um, that being supervisory control and data acquisition. Then we'll talk about variable frequency drives and, and their applications. We'll move on to remote monitoring um, applications, uh, largely focusing on, on those remote monitors that uh, are already out there that you may not know about, but can be pretty useful in utility operations. And then we'll um, end uh, the, the webinar today um, talking about some kind of niche uh, and emerging technologies out there that, that could be of significant uh, significant benefit to uh, certain water utilities. So SCADA, what is it? Um, uh, you, you can spend all day if you want to um, learning about SCADA systems, how they operate, um, what goes into them. Um, so, so in this 10 to 15 minutes, obviously there, there's going to be some glossing over some of the details. Um, it's a pretty old uh, uh, technology platform. Um, uh, that has been proven over the decades and is uh, constantly being updated as technology changes. It, st it stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Um, its first place was really kind of in, in the processing areas, um, uh, industrial processes, uh, treatment facilities, and things like that. Um, for uh, users today, uh, you will almost always have a graphical user interface um, to uh, change set points, um, view your system, view uh, meter readings and things like that, and I'll show you examples of those here in a minute. Um, <clears throat> SCADA can be um, a system that is implemented in a single facility, a local plant, or it can be remotely implemented. So for uh, water and wastewater utilities, um, you often have assets that are spread out over several miles. Um, and, and you do see these assets often being in a, a utility SCADA system or both. Um, it is widely used in both water and wastewater utilities and um, in smaller water and wastewater utilities you will often have a, uh, uh, a single point of control that you can interface both water and wastewater assets and that helps spread some of the cost of it and, and gives benefits to both utilities. As there are many municipalities down the line, I think that's important to pull out right here. So here's a screenshot of what a uh, water utility SCADA system um, interface may look like. If you look up at the upper left, um, you will see that uh, 
information about um, the operations of a raw water intake system. Um, so this is going from the source of supply, and then if you go all the way to the bottom right, um, this is the distribution, uh, water distribution system uh, pumping, and then also the tower on the upper right. Um, so this is a pretty expansive system over um, what is probably most of the, the, the critical assets within this water utility. Um, some things to, to pull out here is that um, it, it is a graphical interface. Um, obviously, things are not to scale. Um, but within each of these items, uh, these, these, these pictures on here, um, you're generally able to click on them and find more information about the, the status of it, how many hours it's been operating, how, much, how many gallons it has flowed, uh, and de depending on the system, um, relevant information to, to operational points. Um, uh, you will also see that there's numerous readouts throughout this. So uh, again, going at the very upper left, TURB is uh, an abbreviation for turbidity. That's very impor important in surface water treatment. Uh, pH, likewise as well, when you're doing water treatment, um, pH can, can drastically change things if it's, if it's out of range. Um, and then flow rates. Obviously, the amount of water incoming and uh, leaving your plant is an important thing to know. You'll follow the water on through. Um, it, it goes through some processing. And then another critical asset, um, it goes into um, the, the filtering system. Again, we have online uh, monitors for turbidity. Um, and it's also keeping track of how frequently it's backwashed, um, which is an important way to maintain compliance with Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, going all the way to the bottom right again, um, you will see that there are three pumps that put water into the distribution system. Um, and you have also an online chlorine monitor. Um, these are pretty common in water treatment facilities. And this tells you real time what the chlorine is um, going into the distribution system. Um, another thing to pull out on this is that you see these gray boxes everywhere. Um, and these gray boxes, uh, going back to the bottom right, D-I-S-T-S-E-T-P is for distribution set point. So you can change um, how and when the, these three pumps um, come on, turn off, um, things like that. Probably off of tower height, um, if, if you were to go into the system, click on that button. Um, so basically, all of these set points allow you to automate many of these uh, treatment processes within the system. This slide is quite a bit different looking. Um, every water utility is uh, a, a unique animal. Um, and this one is, is actually a little bit simpler. They don't appear to really have treatment in their system. Um, but it shows you some of the things that are hidden beneath that, that, that slide that we might have seen earlier. Um, you will see about in the middle, um, kind of to the right of the, the three, three red pumps, is uh, set points. So the set points are on the home string here. So the lead pump will turn on at once pressure system drops to 50 PSI, and it will turn off at 52 PSI. And you'll, then you'll see there are additional pumps that will come on if the pressure continues to drop. Another important thing here is to, uh, to pull out is that when you have an automated system such as, as data operating some or part of your uh, uh, system, um, there's always going to be a manual backup, um, which is important. Um, you know, SCADA can only do what is the information going into it. So uh, you might, for example, um, be alerted as a water operator of a large fire in your distribution system. You know that's going to uh, draw down uh, the pressure in your system. So you might go ahead and turn a couple of these uh, pumps on uh, hand settings so they're, they're, they're manually operating. You might make sure that the, the valve coming in is also on. Um, in order to ensure that you maintain system pressure during the firefight. When we look at SCADA systems, um, the equipment is important to understand. Um, the previous two diagrams um, showed a lot of different assets, but how do those the, the information about those assets get back to you? That's where electronic sensors come in. So for example, um, Almost every water system has numerous water meters, but not every water meter has the ability to talk to an electronic system out of it. So you, you may have to replace some of the current water meters you have if you want to implement a SCADA system. 
Likewise, you would have to have real-time ability to measure pH, uh, monitor chlorine, and things like that in order for a SCADA system to, to be effective. Um, programmable logic controls are a key part of that. Um, this is kind of the uh, workhorse of SCADA systems, um, and they've, they're very reliable electronic um, devices. Um, last I read, the first one ever installed in the world in the late 60s at a General Motors facility is still going today. So um, this is, this is a, a very reliable um, type of apparatus. You will also have to have computer software, and then, and then also key to this is custom programming. Um, uh, you, you saw in the previous two slides, uh, these two water systems look very, very different. Um, and because of that, uh, when you're setting up a SCADA system at your utility, um, there, there will have to be custom programming. Um, uh, it, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. Every utility is unique. Finally, communications. Um, if you have sensors out there in remote places or even within your own plant, somehow that sensor has to be able to talk to um, the, the, the centralized uh, control system. So in a plant, typically not too tough to do. Um, running some wire will, will get you there. However, in, uh, in utilities where you may have remote asset, assets, um, it can be pretty difficult. Um, you know, do you run something like a dark fiber optic cable? Um, do you communicate wirelessly? Um, how do you get around trees and hills? And um, how do you get to the valleys where you're water intake or your wells might be. Um, communications can actually be one of the, the biggest challenges to both setting up a SCADA system and maintaining it. Um, oftentimes, uh, uh, for example, I've, I've worked with systems where uh, their, their communications are great in the wintertime, but when the trees leaf out, they, they have much uh, more difficulty maintaining some of those, those communication systems because the signals are, are more easily blocked. So, this slide um, shows you again, you know, implementing some of that equipment. Obviously, there's pressure sensors out here. Um, there are also, um, uh, you know, communications. Uh, an alarm doesn't do any good unless if you can contact somebody about it. Um, and then you have to have communications back and forth uh, from the, the, the SCADA system to those remote assets, such as your well or the valve um, bringing water in from a, another uh, water system. So when we look at SCADA uh, for optimizing our utilities, um, a little bit about what can be done, where it plays a good role. Uh, electrical savings can be a pretty big one, um, particularly if you are controlling variable speed pumps, which we're going to be talking about here in a couple minutes. But you can also monitor equipment usage, um, such as hours, um, uh, amp readings, and things like that that may indicate problems um, uh, within your system. You can also save a lot of labor, particularly if your system has remote assets that require frequent visits. Um, uh, the utility I used to work at had a well field 12 miles south of town, and the way to turn off a well or turn, turn a well on or to, to check on a well um, to make sure it was operating was to uh, drive down the state highway and then on um, little rutted two-lane roads to get to the well house. Um, once SCADA came along, I mean, you're, you're talking maybe four hours of labor every day was saved um, by, by having the SCADA system. Um, you also have automatic logging of data. This can be really valuable when you're looking at trends. Um, every, everything that has been shown on the previous slides, such as chlorine levels, um, head loss in, in, in filter backwash, turbidity levels, um, the SCADA system system um, has the ability to log those and then export those into like a Microsoft Excel file. So um, you can get a whole lot of information there. The other thing is, is that you also don't have to manually record a lot of information you may be doing without a SCADA system. So for example, um, a, a lot of utilities record um, water meters at, at their treatment facilities or wellheads on a daily or weekly basis. If you have um, these meters tied into your SCADA system, you, you will no longer have to do that. Finally, alarms and dialers. The quicker you know about a problem, um, the, 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 the less labor you have to spend trying to figure out what the problem is. Um, you can also see chemical savings uh, within SCADA systems, um, uh, particularly for newer treatment plans. Um, 
where you can uh, dose chemicals based upon flow rates or other water quality parameters. So you might increase chemicals if turbidity levels in your surface water were higher. Um, that, that is a, a potential area of savings. And then reliability and safety is, is kind of the final one. Um, you'll be able to monitor for trends. Um, you'll be able to respond quicker um, to, to problems within your system. So for example, uh, you'll see uh, pressure drops faster. That means there's either a fire or, or potential a main, potentially a main break, and you can kick those extra pumps on. You also have faster diagnostics oftentimes, be, just because you have more information um, at your fingertip. Um, and then certain times, uh, probably more relevant in wastewater facilities, is that you can monitor confined spaces without having to enter them with, with, um, without having to have main entry on them which is certainly a benefit to safety. So again, you can, uh, this, this very short um, overview here, you can see where these things start to tie together. You have sensors that are telling you about water quality and water flow. You have treatment processes within your treatment facility that um, uh, interact with those sensors and uh, are responsible for water quality. And then you can also monitor your distribution system, see what kind of customer usage you have, um, and ensure that uh, at least some of the water quality goals of the Safe Drinking Water Act are being met. For example, um, turbidity and, and uh, uh, chlorine residual disinfection uh, within this area. I'll be moving on to variable frequency drives now. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about how they work and, and also where they are appropriate um, for water utility operations. So what is a, a variable frequency drive? Um, it's a device that adjusts the frequency of input electricity to vary motor speed. So um, in the United States, we operate on 60 hertz electricity. In, in Europe, it's typically 50 hertz. Um, a motor will spin faster with a faster, uh, with a higher frequency. So the theory is if you can lower the frequency, you can lower the, the revolution speed of the motor. Um, with this, you can have very high power savings if the speed of the motor can be dropped without sacrificing the, 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 the performance. So um, if you're trying to pump water, for example, you're still able to pump water at enough pressure um, would, would be the type of performance metric you'd be um, looking at. Um, if you have very old motors in your system, um, uh, just to note that you do have to have inverter rated motors in, in order to connect to BFE. Most newer motors are going to be inverter rated, uh, particularly those of higher horsepower. Now I'm going to throw some equations at you. Um, the, the, the idea behind variable frequency drives and centrifugal pumping systems, which is what most water pumping is, is that um, uh, is is called the affinity law. Um, the, the the top equation here is that flow is proportional to, to speed. So basically, you have a linear relationship. As you drop speed, uh, you can predictably say um, the flow rate is going to drop as well. However, you go to the bottom here. Power is proportional to the cube of shaft speed. Well, what does that mean? This slide kind of shows you. So again, your your power input is proportional to the uh, revolutions per minute cubed. Um, so let's go from 100% speed where we're drawing 100% power on our electrical motor and it's connected to a centrifugal pump. We drop that to a 50% speed, which would be 30 hertz, which is actually pretty slow for, for, for most pumping applications. You would have a, a power demand would only be 13%. So you can, you can see um, some of this. So if, even if you're only able to drop um, the speed of the motor by 10 to 20 percent, you can see, um, you know, savings of a quarter to a half of uh, the, the, the power demand on your electric motor. Now, what does this mean once you connect this into a utility system? Um, uh, generally speaking, the variable frequency drive manufacturer reps can help you calculate savings based upon the specifics of your utility system. Um, both both the loads and the operating conditions. But a 10 to 30% savings is not uncommon. Uh, again, it does matter a lot depending on what are the, specific, the specifics are within your utility. Um, if 
you do have something like a throttling valve immediately following a water pump, that is a place where you can often see the largest savings with um, variable frequency drives. So keep that in mind if you have um, a pump followed by a valve that's partially closed and, and you run that pump a lot, um, you, you're, you're likely to have a, a pretty good cost savings, a pretty good energy savings if you replace that throttling valve with a variable frequency drive um, in, in, in your utility operation. There's some other important things to know about a variable frequency drive. They have the ability to soft start and soft stop. Um, what this does is instead of um, uh, uh, turning on the electricity and, and starting almost instantaneously, um, you'll slowly ramp up the speed of the motor um, over a minute or two. Um, what this does is that it prevents pressure spikes in your system. Um, so if you have a motor that's turning on and off quite a bit and you also have quite a few main brakes in your utility, part of the problem might be is that you, you, you're sending pressure spikes um, into your utility. Soft stop does the same thing in reverse. Um, the other thing you do with, with soft start and soft stop is that you lower machinery stress. Um, uh, you know, you, you slowly begin the gears rotating on your equipment instead of an instantaneous, um, you know, going full speed. Um, another thing VFDs can do um, that can be pretty valuable is it, you can basically match uh, the water supply and demand almost perfectly if, if you have variable frequency drives in place and, and appropriate sensors going back. Um, this can allow you to keep reservoirs uh, basically full in, in periods of high demand, which can help system reliability. And a lot of systems also utilize variable frequency drives um, that will allow the system to take a, 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 an elevated water tower um, out of uh, service for cleaning or repairs or, or um, you know, periodic painting um, and, and still be able to maintain system pressure um, without having to, to resort to, you know, flowing excess water in order to keep pressure in, in place. Um, you also have the ability to feedback loop for controls. So generally, water pumping applications are going to feed off of either tower elevation and or system pressure. And those are going to go back to those original drawings where we saw various set points. Again, it, it would be off of the, the, the height of the water in, in the tower or, or a system pressure measurement. Um, variable frequency drives also have some motor protections um, that can help against um, poor quality electri electricity and um, some uh, spike protections um, similar to soft starts that are out there on the market. As with anything, there are some cautions. Um, uh, they, they can, uh, as I mentioned, they can be programmed to match demand almost instantaneously to supply. So if you have a water utility um, that's currently operating without variable frequency drives, when you install them in, in your system, you want to be sure that uh, your, your tower is allowed to fill and, and, and drain, so swing in elevation um, as it is currently being done. Um, if you don't do that, you can, you can get some uh, water quality issues within your elevated storage tank. Um, so that's something that can readily be taken care of in, in most programming. Um, the other thing you, you can caution against is that you can take pumps away from their most efficient set point. Um, so if you, if you slow them down too much, um, they may not pump very efficiently. Um, some other things to keep in mind, variable frequency drives do cost money um, to install and maintain. So this would be adding an asset to your system. Um, and, and you really can't forget those sensors um, in order for the uh, variable frequency drives to be effective. Um, so you, you have your sensor in place and, and it allows the, the variable frequency drive to uh, speed up or slow down depending on tower elevation or, or, or system, system pressure. Uh, they do take up space. So if you are retrofitting a facility, uh, keep that in mind. Um, if, you, if you talk to uh, the uh, suppliers, they'll be able to give you sizes for um, whatever horsepower or variable frequency you drive you need. If you were scared by them 15 or 20 years ago, they are quite a bit smaller than they used to be. So um, like most electronics, they are shrinking in size. 
Um, the other thing to note is that they do require proper ventilation. So variable frequency drives do create some heat. Um, so you need proper airflow. Uh, it, it needs to be clean air. And, and in hotter climates, um, you'll sometimes see air conditioning applications to cool the variable frequency drive. Um, even with that, um, the, the savings in uh, electricity and uh, reduction in main breaks tends to be a pretty good value um, for uh, those, those VFD applications. So in summary, variable frequency drives um, can save a lot of energy in the right application. They're, they're not a magic bullet, but they're maybe a silver BB out there. Um, they, they do only work, again, if you have proper sensors in place, they've been programmed properly, and the systems are maintained. Um, be sure not to use, utilize them as a Band-Aid. Don will talk about this a little, a little more, but there are a lot of systems, water utilities out there that have oversized uh, pumping infrastructure. Um, so um, she'll, she'll talk about that a little more. Sometimes a system might, might need a 200-gallon-a-minute pump, but they have an 800-gallon-a-minute pump. Um, the, the variable frequency drives will reduce that flow rate, um, but, but even installing a variable frequency drive on an incorrect application is probably not the way to go forward. A little bit about remote monitoring before I turn it over to Dawn. Um, there's a lot of existing remote monitors out there. I'm going to cover surface water and groundwater um, levels that are out there. But it's important to note, particularly if you're driven by um, uh, irrigation demands, there's a lot of weather monitors out there and also evapotranspiration monitors. So this is the amount of water that is leaving um, through uh, the soil and um, uh, through uh, plant uh, demands. Um, typically, these will be um, uh, through land-grant institutions within uh, your various states. So, um, if you are an irrigation-driven system, um, keep, keep those things in mind. So these existing monitors, um, most of the, the real-time stream flows are, are run by the United States Geological Survey. This is a map of all of their um, online monitors today. Um, and they're color-coded to show high flow, low flow. We won't go too much into that right now. Um, but I will pull up a specific uh, monitor um, in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, what you see here on the, the right is the hydrograph. So you can see the flow rate. Um, and then there's, there's dates on the bottom. A couple things to pull out here. Um, they do keep median statistics on all of these uh, flow gauge, gauges if they've been around for more than a couple years. And then there are all the information from the past years is, is readily available to look up. Um, so for this gauge, you can see a median daily statistic of 45 years um, is available. So if you're looking at, you know, how, how do my, how does my river intake um, fare during past flow uh, rates of the river, um, this is a good place to go. The USGS also has a uh, somewhat more limited groundwater monitoring uh, uh, system out there. Um, these are two wells that, that I used to work with um, back when I was at a utility. Um, generally speaking, real-time groundwater levels are not quite as valuable as um, uh, real-time stream flows, um, just because you, you have less, it's less responsive to uh, precipitation than um, uh, you know, a stream or a lake is. Um, but these are out there, and they may be valuable to your system. Reservoir levels are, are, are kind of another key. Um, uh, this data tends to be a little harder to access. Um, some of it is hosted by different organizations. The Bureau of Land Management, Army Corps of Engineers, and USGS are good places to begin. But you may have reservoirs that are not federally involved. Um, and at that point, you may need to go to the state park or a water office or an irrigation district that, that runs off of that reservoir and keeps track of um, elevation um, data. Um, certainly can be valuable, um, in, particularly in, in, in periods of drought. Local groundwater monitoring may also be nearby you. Um, this is uh, from the groundwater management district north and west of Wichita. Um, uh, they have some real-time monitors, and they also do annual sampling of, of, of a numerous uh, variety of wells within their, their district boundaries. The question you're going to have to ask after finding 
whether or not information is out there is whether that can be a proxy for your utility. Um, sometimes the information is, is good to know, but it's not going to really change how you're going to um, you know, uh, manage your u utility on, on its own. So um, as with any information, you know, there is that question of how useful is it to you. We'll move to utility-specific monitoring. Um, generally speaking, you're going to have a SCADA system, and the monitoring is going to um, go into the SCADA system. Um, you can have monitors that don't feed into control systems. So, so basically, it's just information for you, um, but it doesn't you know, turn a pump on or backwash a filter or, or do anything like that. So some of the monitoring capacities that you can tie into your SCADA systems include electrical. So, you know, what's going on with, with the electrical service at my assets? Water flow rates and volumes very common. Pressure, as we talked, tank elevations, and then valve status. So whether a valve is turned on or turned off. Um, on water level monitoring, where these may be implemented are elevated tanks, underground tanks, supply reservoirs, wells, individual treatment processes within a plant, or local streams that are not otherwise gauged. Um, water quality monitoring, uh, is, this is, uh, the, the sensors are getting better out there, more, more reliable and cheaper. On the supply side, things like turbidity, temperature, pH, and conductivity are often quite valuable um, for uh, treatment operations. And then in treatment or distribution, turbidity again, uh, chlorine, pH, temperature, and then pressure. Um, pressure actually isn't a uh, quality of water, um, but it is uh, useful as a proxy for biological contamination or, you know, uh, the, the, the security of your system um, from uh, contaminants um, outside of your water pipe. Finally, uh, talk a little bit about security. There's getting to be some really good tools out there that are internet connected cameras. You can pull them up on a smartphone. If you are a uh, utility that's having issues with, um, you know, security at remote facilities, you might look into these. They tend to be pretty cheap. And pretty good camera quality and um, relatively easy to implement. So um, I will now turn it over to Dawn as she is going to talk about niche and emerging technologies. Great, thanks Nick. Um, so as Nick said, we'll talk a little bit about some technologies that maybe could benefit your utility that you um, haven't heard about or are a little bit unfamiliar with, so we are going to touch um, on a few of these. So we're going to start with talking about storage tanks and how you can utilize your storage tanks to save energy. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. So when you're looking at your utility and the water that you pump, um, we want you to think about how often your pumps are turning on and turning off. Um, of course, pumps use a lot of energy, and there's a pie chart that shows that those pumps that we use at surface water plants to move that finished water are the biggest of those energy users, and they're typically pumping to a storage tank. So how often are they turning on and off? Because the, the energy that they use costs a, a, a lot of money. Usually it's a significant portion of a water utility's budget uh, for energy costs. And if you have frequent starting and stopping of your pumps, it adds wear and tear to your pump, but also to your pipes. So when you're looking at your system, how often are they turning on and off, and how are you using them to meet peak demand? Are you using the pumps to meet your peak, or are you using your storage tanks? So I've got a couple examples here on the next slide. So this is a system that had has um, 40 million gallons of storage available, but if you look, they're only using about a million gallons of that stored water to meet the peak. They are ramping their pumps up to meet that peak demand, um, and they're actually almost overpowering their available storage. So they're seeing high pressure swings in their system, and as I mentioned, this can be hard on your pipes, on your fittings, on your pumps. So on the next slide, you can see how they've kind of overcome this problem. You make some changes to the operations. You reduce the amount of water that you're pumping. You pump at a more steady level um, instead of swinging up and down. So um, this reduces their energy use and saves them money. 
So you run those source pumps uh, as a constant, uh, as constant as possible. It may not be a, a perfectly straight line, but as constant as possible. And then instead of using the pumps to meet their peak demand, they use more water in their storage tanks. So in this case, they had that 40 million gallons of storage available, and they used 10 million gallons of it during their peak time. This is good for lots of reasons. It's good for water quality. As Nick mentioned, if your water is, if your tanks are being filled constantly, um, the water in the tanks can age, uh, and this can cause for poor water quality in lots of ways. So in this, in this case, you're turning over the stored water more frequently. Your pressure swings are reduced. You have energy savings um, because you're lowering the friction head, you're lowering the static head, um, and you're using your pumps less. And you have overall cost savings uh, because you're reducing your energy and you're probably reducing your demand charges. So on this next slide, you can see how we solve the loading problem um, by using our storage tank like we would use a battery. So you've got some water that's always set aside for emergency, some water that's always set aside for fire, but the rest of the water in the storage tank should be used to help reduce the frequency of the uh, pumping that you're doing. So on the next slide, you can see this comparison that um, if you have a larger pump and it's kicking on, uh, runs for an hour uh, and it kicks on seven times over a two-day window, a 48-hour window. You can see what the cost to run that larger pump is and you can see what the impact is on the, on the tank levels in that blue line. So the tank fills up a little bit and drops a little bit and fills up a little bit and drops a little bit every time that big pump kicks on. However, if you switch to a smaller pump, a, a lower flow rate, and it runs continuously, um, you can see the cost difference, and you can see that the tank never gets lower. Um, the, the volume of the tank never gets lower than it did with the, the bigger pump. Um, and in fact, it does fill up over the course of the two-day window. Uh, so with this example, you would have to think about the availability to you of a smaller pump. So you may have to make a capital investment to buy a smaller pump um, or a jockey pump um, or possibly a VFD if that makes sense where you would still have a need for the higher horsepower pump, the higher flow rates at certain times, but other times not. Uh, that would be an area that, that Nick talked about that you would have to kind of investigate what is most beneficial to have two separate pumps or one pump on a, on a VFD. But chances are that the cost savings would likely pay for the adjustments that you would have to make in the capital investment in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and again, you have opportunity to, decre to decrease your demand charges if you go to a smaller horsepower pump, uh, especially if you look at how you, you exercise the pumps. Uh, you exercise the pumps at the same time that you exercise generators, then you can get rid of demand charges um, altogether sometimes. So there's chances there to save money um, in other ways with the smaller pump as well. So on the next slide, we just point out um, how to detect some of these issues. Uh, if your pump is turning on and off relatively frequently, um, you know you have oversized facilities, the pump was maybe designed for uh, full build-out growth in 10 years, but you're not there yet, so you know that the facility is oversized, or you see very little fluctuation in your storage tank, maybe you're only operating in the top couple of feet, um, and you could operate in the top five feet or six feet instead. Or if you've had any hydraulic modeling done, it can tell you um, that you should be running, you should be using your storage tank more as a battery. So whenever you look at how to overcome these issues or resolve these issues, use your storage tanks. Keep your source pumps, um, the flow as constant as possible, and maybe make some modifications to add that jockey pump or smaller pump to your system. And on the next section, we're going to talk about leak detection, um, leaks in your system and leak detection technology. So we know that if we're losing water, we're losing money. Nobody's paying for it, but we're producing it. So how much are you actually losing? When we have talked about this in the past, we've talked about water produced minus water sold is water loss. 
but that is not correct terminology. So on, the water produced minus water sold is actually the water that's not making us money. So it's non-revenue water. Non-revenue water can include anything that we don't sell. And oftentimes we're doing things like giving water away or there's theft or we have errors. Meters aren't perfect. Data entry isn't perfect. Um, so if there's errors that look like water loss, um, that's non-revenue water. And then you actually have the real losses. Real losses are the issue that we want to think about in capturing the money that we're losing. That's the leaking water. And that can be on your mains, it can be on your service lines, or it can be coming from your tanks. So when we look at that real water loss um, issue versus non-revenue water, you need to think about first determining the causes of non-revenue water before you implement any kind of water loss program. And in order to do that, you can use AWWA's water audit software. Um, it is the industry standard. It's the M36 manual. The software is free. It is Excel-based. And there's a website address there where you, you can download that software if you're interested. Once you discover um, what the non-revenue water causes are, if you do have real losses, where you do have water leaking, um, then there are different tools that you can use to overcome some of those problems. So you can look at your break data, uh, start collecting that data and analyzing that data to see if the breaks are spread across your system or if they're primarily happening in a small section of your system. You can look at improving the speed of the repair time so that you don't lose as much water in any type of broken pipe situation. Uh, you can locate uh, and eliminate any kind of pressure transient. So if you have pressure surges, Nick mentioned um, that if you have a lot of pressure change in your system and you have a lot of leaking water, the two are probably related. So if you can, you can eliminate some of that pressure change, you can probably eliminate some of the water that you're losing. And then there are technologies that you can use that do night flow analysis. Um, you can look at acoustic leak surveys and then um, look at pipe replacement ultimately. So on the next slide, we talk a little bit about the types of technologies that are available to you. Um, there are active listening technologies. These are the sonic ground listening devices. This is where you have someone out in the field um, actively listening to the pipe um, or to the appurtenances on the pipe uh, for changes in sound that indicate that you have a leak. So this, the water moving through the pipe makes a sound. Water moving through a leak makes a much higher sound, higher pitched sound. Um, and you can help locate leaks by listening to the water passing through the pipe. And you can do that actively or you can do it passively. So with passive listening, this is where you deploy devices typically on valves and meters. Um, and they listen to the pipe, the water flowing through the pipe primarily uh, at nighttime because then you don't have other sounds that might sound like leaks or look like leaks, so to speak, um, such as traffic, um, you know, people, radios, things like that. So we do uh, analysis for a window of time in the middle of the night. And then that data is transmitted back to a central location. These devices can be deployed in different ways. They can be deployed permanently so that you've got them out there always, or they can be deployed semi-permanently. So you put them in one place for three months, and then you move them to another place for another three months, um, and they can listen in, uh, in a new location for new leaks. And then there are other types of technologies out there. There's tracer gas leak detection, um, which is what it sounds like. It uses a gas um, to find leaks in the pipeline. And if it surfaces, it will help you identify the locations. Um, and then there are internal devices that run through your pipes while they're flowing. Um, and they look, they listen for leaks as well, but they're actually inside of your pipes. Some of them are tethered like the Sahara. Some of them are not tethered like the Smart Ball. You put it in at a fire hydrant and you catch it somewhere down the line at another fire hydrant. Of course, each of these has a very in price points, um, so the return on investment has to be uh, kind of analyzed and thought through when you're thinking about 
how you want to capture uh, that lost water. And on the next section, we're going to talk about um, the use of drones. So when you think about your system and how you, um, how much system there really is, uh, have you ever considered the use of drones? They're relatively new technology, um, but they are being used in lots of different applications. And I think in the water industry, there's a great opportunity um, for us to use drones with the idea of inspection, um, with maintenance, and with testing. And one of the nice features about a drone is that it can be programmed to look um, at an asset from the same location and the same angle for every visit so, so that you have a very fair comparison um, of before and after or from visit to visit. Um, of course, a drone can be safer than in person. It can be faster than in person. So if you need to know what's going on on the top of your elevated storage tank, um, like in the picture, a drone is a great little tool to see what's going on up there without having to have anyone to climb the tank um, and to take on the risk of being um, you know, on the, on the ladder and on the top of the tank. Uh, we can do more frequent inspections with drones. And the drones can be equipped with tools, um, with sensors that can help you do some detection or some testing like ultrasound and thermal imaging. And we're going to talk about those here in just a second. Um, and the last thing that I thought about pointing out is that we do have a lot of areas that are very remote um, and sometimes difficult to get to in times of snow or wet weather. Um, so if we can, we can use the drone to make sure that everything's still OK, um, it may save valuable time and money. So drones are something that I think are up and coming in our industry for sure. And then the next technology that we want to talk about is um, uh, condition monitoring. The kind of newest is energy condition monitoring. Um, it's a little bit maybe less thought of than some of the more traditional monitoring, uh, which maybe you're familiar with vibration or ultrasound or temperature, thermography or tribology or lubricant analysis, um, pump performance gauging. Those are a little bit more common. Um, but there was just a recent article that stated that condition monitoring can decrease your motor O&M expenses by up to 25%. That's a significant amount. Um, so doing continuous condition monitoring through energy monitoring um, is something that you should be familiar with. And the use of this energy monitor monitoring is increasing. Um, it's an affordable method of monitoring, and it can detect any type of electrical damage. Um, so you have that opportunity to intervene before the asset is flying apart, like in the picture there. <laughs> so um, when we think about some of the more traditional types of monitoring, uh, they're not always continuous, but um, there, there are benefits to doing those as well. So if you're not familiar with some of those, ultrasound can be used for high speed and for slow speed mechanical applications um, and for fluid situations. The Meters are listening for high frequency signals from the bearings and um, displaying the results. So that's uh, one way that you can monitor. And then another is to take a look at um, the next slide is the thermography. So you have thermal cameras that look at the heat um, in the asset. And they take pictures, um, and they're kind of very colorful. and and fun to look at, but they have different um, indications that can tell you if something's changed within uh, any moving type of, of asset. Um, so for preventative maintenance, thermal in images can be taken over time and compared, and the technology is becoming more and more affordable. Um, so there are even um, cameras now that can be added just to your smartphone. Um, so the and those little handheld units now, there it's it's a lot more um, affordable than it was in 
even just recent years. So just to be aware of um, some of the opportunities to do condition monitoring and to know that it can help you detect changes and prevent failure um, by being able to do some maintenance before the asset has broken down. So that's um, the end of the discussion on the different types of technologies that are up and coming. Um, and we will open it to question and answers now. We've had some questions come in, so we'll address those. And if you have not submitted yours yet, um, please feel free to do so. So Nick, we had some questions come in during your presentation. Um, the first being, what is the cost of keeping the software of SCADA current? Um, that depends on your vendor. Um, a lot of SCADA systems are actually like not internet connected, which from a security standpoint is likely a, a good way to proceed. Um, so uh, you might enter into a, um, it, it's sort of like buying an old computer software program at that point. So you're not constantly, you know, needing updates because you don't have the, the, the same level of security risk. Um, so you might end up actually just buying the software once and then oftentimes if something goes awry you would you would have uh, more likely than not the installer of the system um, come back and uh, reprogram or, or diagnose some of the issues that that is something that uh, oftentimes people are, are fairly um, intimidated by the SCADA system and and every little hiccup they they, they might feel that they need to call their vendor on um, so, uh, depending on how tech savvy you are, that, that is something else to look at. All right. And another question about the VFDs. You talked about VFDs in warm environments. Um, they had a question about moist environments. Are there any concerns about having VFDs in moist environments? Um, yes. Uh, particularly if you're at like a water treatment plant where you'd also likely have chlorine. Um, the uh, that that is another corrosive element. So um, uh, you know, cool, dry is is always best for um, electronics. A lot of times, what you see in in VFDs is that there's actually kind of a, a outside air um, supplied to it. So um, uh, def definitely, um, moisture is is an issue too. All right, great, thanks. Um, and we had a couple of questions come in um, to, about the kind of the technologies that we talked about as well. So um, one is a comment, and I absolutely agree with it, that when you're looking at using your storage tanks as batteries and how you can fill those um, at different times or constantly, you might also want to look at your energy rate schedule. Uh, there are different rate schedules for energy just like the water utilities charge different rates to different customers for different reasons. Um, and some energy utilities offer a time of use or time of day rate schedule. Um, and so it's less expensive. The energy costs less at off-peak times. So that would be overnight, uh, just like our, our water use peaks, so does energy use. So at off-peak times, your energy costs would be lower. So if you're looking at adjusting the way that you're filling your tank and the way that you're using your tank, it may be worthwhile to contact your energy provider. So thank you for that comment um, and to point that, that out. And then we had a question about the leak detection technologies and the listening. Um, it says that in the past it was difficult to listen on PVC pipe. Is there new technology um, that's still very much the case that listening on PVC pipe can be difficult. The sound does not transmit as readily as it does on metal pipe. Um, and that's what some of those other technologies, the inline technologies, can be used for. Um, sometimes they include, um, they're not just listening, they're also looking. So they have um, a light and a camera so that the leaks can be seen as the technology is traveling through the pipe. Of course, uh, as I mentioned, um, there are costs associated with that, so you have to kind of weigh the advantages and disadvantages of identifying those leaks depending on 
how leaky your system is so, <laughs> and maybe how um, reliable your source is and those kinds of things. Um, and it looks like we have lots of questions coming in. Um, but I think that we are about out of time, so I we will address any questions that we didn't get to answer, and I am going to turn it back over um, for our uh, last couple of polling questions here, and then we will wrap it up. Okay, great. Yes, we just have two polling questions. I'm going to launch those now because we're running out of time. The first is, would you like to subscribe to our Environmental Finance Center blog? And just select your preference there. If you are unable to answer the question, you can always do so at um, on our website. Okay, and the polling is in process. And I will close the poll now. All right, our second polling question and the last one for today. We are launching that. Are you interested in receiving in-depth technical assistance for your small water system? You can let us know. Just take a few seconds to put in your responses, and we will follow up with you personally based on your response to this poll. Okay, I am going to be closing this poll in just a few seconds. Okay, all right, well, that is it for today. Thank you both Nick and Don for providing your expertise here on the technologies we use to save energy resources and time in water system operations. Thanks to everyone who joined us. We will do our best to follow up with those last few remaining questions, and I will throw it back to our presenters for any remaining comments. Uh, no, um, like Tom said, we'll, we'll try to get to any um, questions that, that were coming in as we're running out of time. And uh, feel free to um, email myself or Dawn and, um, with, with any questions you may have offline. Uh, you have our email addresses and uh, phone numbers both. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Dawn if she has anything further. Thank you all for your time and for your attendance. We appreciate it. And we have lots of questions about will copies of presentation be available, transcripts. Um, everything will be posted on EFC Network's website. Uh, we do ask for about two weeks to get the video processed and posted. So thank you all again. We appreciate it. OK, and I will be sending out a survey. Uh, take a minute to do that if you like. Other than that, we will um, talk to you soon. All right, thanks.